Okay, good morning. Ah, okay, nice to know somebody's awake. Someone who's been here long enough to adjust to the time change. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the Cisco sponsored room. This is our second session of the day. Um, I'll get a little housekeeping out of the way first, then I'll get into a quick introduction and turn over to our presenters. Um, as each of you came in the door, you were given a little business card size card, ironically. Um, we're doing a drawing at the end of the day, today's session for an Apple Watch, so if you want to fill that out, I'll be collecting all the entries in the fishbowl at the end of the session. Um, as you're circling the session numbers on the little card, this is session number two. So with that out of the way, I'm going to get into um, just some quick introductions. Uh, Balaji, Karthik, and Mike. Uh, Balaji and Mike from Cisco, Karthik from Red Hat. Um, all the, pro all the titles right there, so I'm going to let them go into a little bit of more detail on each of their backgrounds uh, as the presentation goes on. Again, thank you for coming. We're going to make sure we have some time for uh, Q&A at the end of the session as well. So with that, Balaji, all uh, yours. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Balaji Siva. I uh, manage the UCS-based uh, open source solutions. OpenStack Solutions is one of the things that I actually work with, with our partners, uh, Red Hat. Uh, Karthik is one of the key c contributor from the Red Hat side uh, in our joint solution. And Mike, uh, he's the director of product management for Cisco ACI Solutions, which is basically our networking solutions. Um, basically, our session will go, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, you know, why we are doing this solution together and, and what benefits that we provide to the customers. And then um, Mike will cover ACI-specific uh, uh, content at the end of the session. So the, one of the things that I sort of take away from, my, uh, from the keynote address today morning was that it's, you have to have super in front of you, right? You have to be a super user or super integrator or super woman, I guess. Um, if you're not super, then you're not uh, cool. So one thing that we want to do is actually uh, provide a solution, make OpenStack accessible to the common man. Um, so that's really our goal. Um, I know that uh, over multiple OpenStack uh, summits that I've been on since Boston Summit, I think Mike and I uh, were there four years ago, we know that the, you know, the bigger companies or bigger, uh, you know, the Comcast of the world, the Yahoo's of the world, were able to put enough resources to make OpenStack work. We know that. Um, but the, the, the typical enterprises, small size enterprises, they don't necessarily have the expertise or the time and effort to make OpenStack, you know, deployable in their data centers. And that's the goal of um, what this uh, solution we're going to talk about today. So essentially bringing sort of enterprise grade OpenStack, uh, you know, you, we wanted you to make it uh, come uh, online faster, but also be able to scale as you go along. So one of the key things that's driving why this whole fastness comes into play is sort of the, the evolution of the IT that's transformation that's, that's happening overall. You know, at Cisco, we call it the fast IT. Essentially, you know, traditionally, you're used to an IT where your primary, um, you know, your primary uh, goal is to make efficient uh, IT infrastructure that's reliable and stable and works, and that's been the case for, you know, I guess the last 20 years. But now with the, uh, with the sort of the need for a DevOps model and the evolution of uh, every, everybody wants everything faster. Nobody wants to have a water flow model for the software development, right? I mean, I think at Cisco when I started, it was more like a, you know, you submit a PRD or a product requirement document, six months later something comes out. And those days are obviously over. So software development teams are moving into a more agile way of developing because it makes sense. Um, but also you need to have the IT be ready to be able to support some of these newer workflows. And that's sort of the, the sort of the Gartner defined as a more do IT, where you're able to support these developer infrastructures. Um, this could be using containers like we talked about in the, in the keynote, or it could be uh, other forms of uh, fast way to deploy IT infrastructure. And so one of the key things that I see is that uh, open source being a big part of this uh, fast IT, meaning if you look at any solution that's available in the market, um, open source is a huge component of it. All the solutions you talk about, OpenStack, you know, the container movement, a lot of the things are open source. 
And, but open source uh, adopting in my organization as an IT organization is not that easy. There's a lot of challenges to be able to take uh, an open source uh, product out there and be able to adopt. You know, you really want speed, but then it doesn't mean that it, it, it is not that easy to get speed quickly. There's a lot of integration of different components that you need to get in from the open source itself, and you be need to have to put the work to make it happen. So the speed of deployment um, is, is actually um, difficult to get, achieve. There's also the risk involved. Um, obviously, there's things that are changing, particularly in the case of OpenStack, for example. You have have a release coming out every six months. How do you upgrade to a next level of software? How do you uh, deal with anything that happens? There is a risk involved in terms of um, maturity of the many of the projects. It keeps on evolving. I think uh, Karthik will talk about how the Liberty and the next release will change one more time. But you can see that there's a lot of risk involved when you want to actually be, a, be the IT that's supporting this solution for your internal organizations. You know, it's, it's cool to go open source, it's cool to you deploy OpenStack, but then if you're not able to meet your demands of your internal customers, it doesn't really work. And the big piece is the retain flexibility, right? We talked about, um, obviously, deploying this is a challenge, but also you want to not necessarily locked into something. Um, for example, I'll give you an example in the container world. There's, there's so many different uh, uh, startups evolving that keep on changing the way you, uh, some of these components are used. What's cool one six months ago is not cool any, any longer. And you need to be able to have the flexibility to be able to avoid vendor lock-ins as you adopt your open source projects. Um, one of the other big things that we talk about is support for the solution itself. As you deploy the solution, in the case of OpenStack, for example, you know, who are you going to call for support? You know, the support has to sort of uh, encompass all, both the hardware as well as the software elements uh, that comes with it. And if you make any customization, how do you get support for that specific customized pr product that you have? You don't want necessarily a locked in, in in that sense as well because you have one vendor, now you're locked into the vendor. Um, so there are deployment complexities that we talked about, you know, obviously deployment being uh, the bigger challenge of deploying the open source software. Now you're deploying on a specific hardware and you need to worry about plugins that, that, that you need to use to enable that and, and ongoing maintenance of those uh, different products. Obviously this all involves means complexity, right? And this is all the challenges you see in adopting open source in your fast IT uh, process change. And um, and I think specifically speaking of OpenStack specifically, it's actually lagging behind in terms of promise and fulfillment. Um, if you, this was the research data that I uh, that I that I took from uh, 451 Research, that basically uh, polled a bunch of enterprise uh, customers and asked for their opinion on, you know, what is the promise of OpenStack and, and how it has kept up the promise and how, it is, a f uh, how is the fulfillment of that promise uh, to, you know, uh, and if you look at it, OpenStack is a data last in terms of all the other solutions that's in the market. If you double click on what exactly are the different um, areas that people have kind of given a bad, a lower scores, is, is all of the things you could talk about. Support is a big part of it. Um, you know, obviously the reliability piece of it, the security piece of it, the experts that's available to support your solution. Once you create this monster in-house, you know, you're gonna maintain that monster going forward, right? As you bring in different components and create this solution, you're gonna have problems. So that's what's, you know, obviously being shown here. The great example is sort of a customer who, uh, this is a customer quote from a financial customer who talks about, you know, you know, everybody talks about OpenStack and, you know, deploying it, but they're talking about small scale. Of course, the large guys are doing large scale because they have the ability to do it. But if it's small scale, I think everybody can do it, right? You can have 10 servers, 20 servers, you can do it. But once you start pushing the scale, um, you really need the support system to be able to not only do it day one, but also through day end. So, um, so one of the things that we think at Cisco is that um, you know, we are basically a provider of infrastructure itself. But then we, we see an opportunity for, for us to be able to guide and help the customer as they start deploying our infrastructure for the specific use case. Yes, I want to deploy OpenStack. Now, I'm struggling with it over three months, six months, whatever the number of months you have. 
uh, you know, we want to be able to solve it for you or at least be able to help you in that case. So we want to provide you a couple of choices. Uh, we know that not one size fits all for all our customers. So you can build on your own, which is typically what people do. They, they, they get uh, open source components and software and build and run on their own. It's basically customer deployed and customer managed, which is most of the cases. There's also cases where customer is able to um, don't want to even manage. Essentially, they want to be able to run the infra, run the you know actually use the product, use the open stack, the promise of open stack, without the difficulty of actually enabling open stack. The other option, obviously, can go to the cloud, and they just say buy computers as a service. But of course, that's sort of the uh, AWS model, which you, people do all the time, and that's why AWS has a good growth. But if you want to run it in your own uh, private uh, infrastructure. Um, you have an option to choose, you know, you build and manage yourself, or we can actually manage it for you. So there are two options um, Cisco has. One is the what we're going to spend some time, which is called the UCS Integrated Infrastructure for, for OpenStack. Um, this is a basically a partner-based solution where we work with our partners to build a f full stack for you that you can manage and we will provide you support. The other piece is a Cisco Metapod which is essentially based on our meta cloud acquisition, where we are basically running the infrastructure for you. You don't have to do anything except provide an IP address, the servers obviously, and the, the switches, and we will essentially you know, bring, your own, bring your own software and, and not only deploy it, but also run it for you 24 by seven. So that's a model that for people who are, uh, want the easy button essentially and, and use it, as an AWS, but then it's still running in your own um, data center. So those are the two options. And today, like I said, we're going to spend time on how we are helping to help the first case, which is build and run on your own. So one of the things that we are using to enable you to have a faster way to deploy this, uh, your own self-managed cloud, is, uh, is using the Cisco validator design. Cisco validator design is usually is, should not be a new news for customers, Cisco customers, um, because we have been doing this validator designs uh, for quite some time for a lot of other solutions. So, for example, we have solutions uh, if you want to deploy VDI, you know, VMware based VDI or Citrix based VDI solutions or SAP, HANA, different kinds of solutions. We have over 26 solutions um, that basically takes a specific use case. And we sort of uh, define the requirements of customers, talking to customers, and getting the definition from customers, and, and, and go through an end-to-end -end, uh, use case development, um, including all the components. Some of them could be Cisco components. Some of them could be a partner component. But we do, we do the validation, and we do uh, full system-level testing, and we provide us a blueprint that you could go and deploy it. And the beauty of the blueprint is that if you want to do have Cisco advanced services come and deploy it for you, they will do that. Or if you want your partner you know, come and deploy it for you, if, you, you know, if you're using Cisco partner or some other partner, they know this blueprint works because Cisco and other partners are behind it and validating it. So they are able to come and um, deploy it for you. And the key part of this overall validator design is the support that goes behind it. Once you have deployed it, obviously we will provide uh, you know, different, uh, varia different uh, sort of versions of it, obviously, as you go along from version one to version two. Um, we will also support you uh, through a Cisco support model, Cisco solution support, which is actually a pretty good um, way to feel comfortable deploying this blueprint. So the, the OpenStack specifically is, is running on the Cisco UCS, we call it Cisco UCS Integrated Infrastructure because essentially it takes all the elements that you need, a compute storage and network, and, and provide it in one package. Um, so it uses the Cisco UCS, which is uh, uh, number one um, blade server in the, in the, in the US and, 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 and maybe one or two in the world, as well as uh, we also have the Rackmon servers, that's also ma which makes us top five in the, um, in the worldwide server market. The, the one other innovation that UCS did um, is the ability to integrate network and compute and storage together in the same uh, same infrastructure and make it fully automatable. So we have ability to um, 
basically scale a large number of compute and manage it together. So Cisco, man Cisco UCS manager essentially manages a, uh, a cluster of compute nodes as a, you know, from a single uh, entry point. And also you have a UCS director which even scales beyond that and provides additional infrastructure automation. Cisco Nexus, which is basically our Nexus switching infrastructure, and Nexus 9000 being our premier uh, switch that, that's in the market in the last couple of years that, uh, that Mike will talk about. We also introduced something called ACI, which is an application control, uh, application centric infrastructure, which is our SDN uh, innovation that uh, Mike will touch upon a little bit more. And the key part of this infrastructure is that the, we are working with partners, um, Cisco, uh, you know, Red Hat, uh, NetApp, Intel, and, and other partners as we have built the solutions. So we have a couple of offers that we want to talk about today. Um, these are available um, either today or next week. One is the Cisco UCS with the Red Hat OSP uh, uh, OSP director and Red Hat OSP platform, uh, Red Hat OpenStack platform, uh, with uh, Ceph storage, as this is called a UCS uh, solution that on the on the, on the left side, you, on to your left that you see there, um, that will be available basically this week or next week. We'll have that blueprint available for you. Um, the other solution that we have essentially is take OpenStack and have it run on FlexSpot. FlexSpot is, as you know, is a Cisco NetApp. Uh, joint development. We have provided this with the NetApp storage, basically, backbone NetApp storage, Cisco Nexus uh, switches, Cisco UCS, and NetApp storage. We have basically validated OpenStack for uh, our FlexPod customers. We have a, quite a bit of FlexPod customers, busy NetApp customers, who want to continue to use NetApp storage back in storage, and we want to be able to provide that solution for them. So we'll talk about two solutions. The key thing on both of them is that these are both enterprise ready. We have tested the various use cases and have it available as a turnkey model. And, um, and we, will, we will be you know, either already available or we'll be making it available shortly. And I want to actually hand it over to Karthik. And I think you know, he has been working on Red Hat for four years and, and, uh, and of course, OpenStack. And you know he has a different perspective that I want to I want him to say to us. Good. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Balaji. And before I even get into OpenStack and all the fun stuff and how we've seen the market evolve over the last four years, let me start a little bit with a, a somewhat different example, different industry, right? So if you guys go back and look at the early days of commercial automobiles, late um, 18th century, um, late uh, 19th century, early uh, 20th century. And you look at how the, the early manufacturers are producing automobiles. Pretty much every car was coming out as a custom, unique design, right? And then what happened was Ford came along and you had the concept of an assembly line and most importantly, well-known building blocks that can be pieced together so you can produce cars, commercial automobiles at scale. And so today, how many of you go, when you go to buy a car, go to the manufacturer and start pulling together a, piece of, a bunch of piecemeal parts and assemble your own car versus just going to a showroom and buying a car and maybe customizing it a little bit, right? So the comparison I want to draw is when you take that and look at what's been happening with the different generations of OpenStack deployments that have been happening, the first couple of years, going back three, four, five years of OpenStack uh, evolution, the first two, three years, Pretty much every major deployment was a custom deployment. Uh, different super users, if you will, different enterprise customers were looking to tweak it to the nth degree. And what's been happening is over the last year to a year and a half, there's been a marked trend towards moving away from what I would call, in fact, the community calls these sort of custom boutique snowflakes into more standard solutions. And the reason for that is because increasingly more and more customers are not looking to have a completely tweaked and unique custom snowflake. What they're trying to do with OpenStack is have it deployed, have it work reliably, and get to the business value they're trying to accomplish with OpenStack. What is the business objectives they're trying to accomplish with this infrastructure, right? How are they getting business value? And they want to get to that business value really quickly. 
so OpenStack as an end in itself, we pass that generation to the next generation of customer deployments that we see very often with at Red Hat because we've been talking to customers around OpenStack deployments quite a bit is that customers are no longer looking at OpenStack as an end in itself. They're looking at how do they get value on top of OpenStack. What are the use cases? Are they deploying containers? Are they deploying Hadoop as a service? Are they deploying other kinds of uh, leading edge workloads on top of OpenStack? And so to, to, that, uh, to that point, customers are coming to us now saying, how do I get to a stable OpenStack deployment at scale quickly? And so what we've been doing together between Red Hat and Cisco and with our partners like Intel and NetApp is how do we take the leading pieces that are pretty common across all of these major OpenStack deployments, how do we simplify them? How do we turn them into foundational building blocks that can be connected to each other so that they can be deployed at scale and deployed quickly, deployed easily, and really how do you support that in production as the innovation continues to happen in OpenStack at a very rapid pace, right? So I'll come back and talk to what's happening uh, moving to future releases, but really how do you take this, the set of foundational building blocks and get them to, uh, to be deployed in a, in a stable fashion? And that's the key problem that we're trying to solve together with Cisco and our partners like Intel and NetApp. So with that said, the solutions that Balaji talked about, we are really vetting these solutions for the common enterprise use cases that we see. You know, things like making sure the infrastructure has high availability, making sure that when customers need to upgrade between releases, maybe as they're looking at continuous deployment, continuous upgrades processes, that we have well-defined processes for how do we take them between releases. And how do we really build an ecosystem of partnerships and partners that are able to stand behind these foundational building blocks and build bigger solutions that can provide enterprise value, right? So no longer is it about taking just OpenStack and customizing every little widget you have within OpenStack, but taking these foundational building blocks and using them to get to business value quicker, right? And that's the key target that we're trying to accomplish. So one quick plug I'll make here, and this is something I'm saying as a Red Hat person, so I'm not wearing a Cisco hat, Cisco hasn't paid me for this, although they do have me on stage for this, is when you've deployed OpenStack at scale, our experience from having done this at Red Hat is not all platforms are created equal. Now there are some unique benefits to, to the Cisco UCS and to the Nexus architectures that lend themselves to a uh, better customer experience as, as it comes to OpenStack deployments. So when you, when you go back and you track the kinds of challenges that our customers, our Red Hat customers have had with deploying OpenStack at scale and what are the kinds of issues they encounter, very often there are, you can break them down into two buckets. There's issues with initial deployment, which is how do we get a deployment to happen in a stable fashion and as quickly as possible without having to spend weeks or months of time troubleshoot, troubleshooting the initial deployment when things go wrong. The second bucket is once that's been deployed, how do you keep it operationally stable in production, especially as you start to do things like upgrading software, especially as you start to you have to deal with new operational teams coming on board and having to manage and, and update hardware, whether it's firmware, whether it's NIC cards, whether it's other things that could typically go wrong in a, in a scale environment, right? And when you look, step back and you look at the UCS architecture, just a quick show of hands, how many of you guys have actually deployed on UCS before? The Cisco guys don't raise your hands, I'm sure you have, right? If you've never, by the way, how many of you guys have deployed OpenStack at your companies? Okay, so a few hands up, so otherwise I'm gonna be going like, so are you guys in the right room? But anyway, so when you step back and you take, take a look at the steps required to deploy OpenStack in production for the first time. The unique aspects of the UCS architecture that, uh, that are really important, that really provide value to an OpenStack deployment is this concept of service profiles. So when you take uh, just the bare metal UCS hardware, it doesn't really have any sort of intelligence in how that hardware is glued together. When you actually apply a UCS service profile onto the hardware, you can define a UCS service profile based on templates that you would define. You then specify how that hardware needs to be bolted together, 
how you take the raw CPUs, memory, NIC cards, storage, all of the different components, and how you want them connected up, and in effect, give that brick a profile. And in an OpenStack context, the really amazing thing that this brings is the ability to define templates for the different OpenStack roles. When you have a scaled OpenStack deployment with, say, let's say, three or five or 15 controllers, with let's anywhere from two to a couple of hundred compute nodes, right? The ability to define a service profile that says for a controller, this is how it needs to be cabled up. These are the five different networks or six different networks that need to connect to a controller for storage connectivity, for tenant VLANs, for multiple tenant VLANs are required, and multiple external networks, for internal API traffic with an open stack. Similarly, define storage profiles to say exactly how the disks are laid out. Also, things like firmware, being able to specify which version of firmware needs to run on a given node. And put that into a service profile template, and then apply that template on a given node, which puts it into a controller role. And have a completely different template for a compute node, a completely different template for a Ceph node. And then apply the template, and then deploy OpenStack. That process of having a templated deployment is something that eliminates literally so many of the real world customer issues that we've seen from having to deploy OpenStack at scale. So if you go back and look at the history of all of the customers we've dealt with over the last two or three years and the deployment challenges that you've seen, so many, in fact, the vast majority of those challenges have to do with things like something miscabled somewhere some little firmware and one server being a different version than the rest. And the ability of UCS and Nexus as well on the networking side to be able to define this sort of service profiles and enforce them on a given node before you start the OpenStack deployment essentially eliminates a whole, just the majority of these deployment challenges. Similarly, once you have it deployed in production, the ability to really avoid this concept of nodes drifting from the initial profile. So for example, as you add more compute nodes, as you add more controller nodes, as you have to scale your environment to a larger size. Again, being able to take those identical service profile templates and applying them to nodes really guarantees and gives you a lot more confidence that as you add nodes into the pool, it's not going to accidentally be misconfigured to cause a whole bunch of the operational issues that you see in production with OpenStack today. So part of the challenge with OpenStack is the amount of, you know, it, this is a benefit, is the amount of innovation that's happening, but that always typically means that the troubleshooting tools, the expertise, the people, the knowledge that you need to have in your teams to be able to troubleshoot when things go wrong, it always tends to lag behind the innovation to a, by, by a few weeks to a few months. And so having this sort of a consistent well-defined templated deployment, both for initial deployment as well as for ongoing operations, really helps address that key operational challenge that most enterprise customers tend to face. And so this is really a plug that I want to give for Cisco in terms of what they bring to the table. And now, the other part of that, if you will, is looking at how all of this innovation is brought to the market in OpenStack. Now, if if all of this was just constrained to the hardware and then OpenStack is just an application or infrastructure layer that runs on top of it, that's one thing. But really the way it's, it's, uh, Cisco has brought this to OpenStack is all of this hardware innovation, the platform innovation, is being exposed through OpenStack via OpenStack plugins. Whether it's a different uh, ML2 Neutron plugins on the networking side, or in the case of uh, things like uh, the UCS uh, differentiation, that's being exposed via uh, different drivers being brought to bear on the Ironic, or on the Neutron, or on other, other OpenStack modules. And so for someone who's deploying OpenStack uh, at scale in an enterprise, they can benefit from all of this with a unified view from within OpenStack, rather than having a whole bunch of different management tools on the UCS and the Nexus side, and a completely different set of tools on the OpenStack side. So what we're doing together is taking all of the common plugins that we see as relevant for uh, enterprise customer use. Uh, the ones that we've started with here are the Nexus ML2 plugin for uh, physical connectivity on the Nexus NXOS side with uh, the Nexus 1000V for virtual switching and all of the benefits that the Nexus 1000V brings to the, brings to the table, including better troubleshooting, performance, uh, better operations management, and being able to tie it into the existing processes that you would use to manage Cisco devices. 
along with the UCSM ML2 plugin, which takes care of uh, orchestrating all of the uh, configuration settings on the UCS infrastructure itself, such as the Fabric and TikNX, auto configuring the VLAN information, auto configuring some of the core data, and expose that via OpenStack. Um, this is all the more important now moving forward with OpenStack because of what's happening upstream within OpenStack. First of all, there's a new governance model, the big tent. I'm sure you guys have all heard about that. What that means is there's going to be a lot more projects coming into OpenStack that self-classify as, okay, I'm all, you know, the new projects can also classify themselves as OpenStack. In addition, what's also been happening with some of the OpenStack projects like Neutron is the vendor plugins like some of the ML2 plugins are being taken out of tree. And so it's doubly important to have a partnership like we have between Red Hat and Cisco to uh, working with our partners like Intel and NetApp and others to really pick the common pieces that we think are, are extremely um, important to customers and collaborate in how do we make the customer experience better. So that's all things that we collaborate on together. And so I want to leave you with that and turn it over back to Balaji and Mike to take it to where we're going in the future as well. All right. Thanks, Karthik. So I want to basically talk about what's available, what's not available, and sort of give you a little bit more detail about these two stacks that we have. So think of it as an integrated stack of uh, solution that's available for, for, for sale um, or, or, or that's fully supported. So the this, this first one is the FlexPart solution we talked about where the backend storage is a FlexPart uh, FAS uh, file system 8040, the E-series uh, storage basically for Cinder and, um, and Swift uh, storage for the NetApp model. And then it is using the, um, the Juno release of OpenStack on the FlexPart today. We will obviously update with Liberty uh, as, you know, as, as, as we get into an OSP uh, version that supports Liberty. But today it's basically a Juno base that's available. We, we ship this uh, uh, CVD um, basically beginning of uh, a, uh, September and that is available, supported by NetApp uh, partners. The second uh, solution is the UCS solution uh, with uh, OSP7, which is basically a kilo-based uh, deployment solution, and using the Ceph ba backend storage, which is basically using the Cisco U UCS uh, C-series as a Ceph nodes, and that's available basically next week. So, Key part I want to leave with that, besides the solutions being available, besides the, the blueprints and the solution CVD being available, is the support that goes with it. So you would need support, um, not only in obviously we have built this, so you can take that and, and deploy it yourself. Observably, you can do that, and that saves you a lot of headache as it is without even, you know, calling Cisco or calling Red Hat uh, on this topic. But you're going to need a support, um, you know, maybe that you, you need to even support for day zero as you're deploying this. And also, once you've deployed it, you, now you want to uh, get support for adding more nodes or other issues that you have. Or you want to get, when you get to the next release of software, how do you go from, let's say, in this case, Kilo to uh, Liberty or beyond? So we, we have a model where Cisco is a single number to call. So you have Cisco solution support. And you have single number to call Cisco, and then we would take the call. We do the triaging for the solution overall. If there's specific OpenStack or Red Hat related issues that we need Red Hat help on, then we will go ahead and call Red Hat on on the back end from a from a from a customer perspective, from your perspective. You are able to call Cisco and you are able to get the single point of support. And we we figure out the logistics of uh, making the uh, sort of support more seamless for you. So that's all I have on the overall the solution. And I want to give it to Mike, who's going to talk to us about the awesome ACI and Nexus 9Ks. Yeah. So you know, I have the honor of being between you guys and lunch. Um, and I think I have about two minutes to get through everything. So I'm going to show you an abridged set of slides. And I'm going to hopefully finish on time for you guys to actually get your food. Um, but I did want to spend a minute or two to talk about the Nexus platforms and how the Nexus platforms are highly flexible and can fit in, you know, as a component of these kind of solutions and how they'll also offer platforms for evolving the solutions to more advanced SDN technologies. So w the way we thought about the Nexus platform, in particular Nexus 9000, was a, was a multi-deployment strategy where you could deploy the switch in what we call a programmable network fashion 
which is again what you saw to some degree in some of the solutions that you know, we're now doing with UCS and Red Hat, which basically run standard uh, you know, NXOS and allow it to fit into all of our existing network topologies that, that you have today, with APIs available for things like OpenStack plugins to manage them. And again, that's the bread and butter of our business, and that's where a lot of the deployments are happening today. We also have advanced capabilities in what we call the programmable fabric. We're still within NXOS, we can use protocols like uh, BGP eVPN and allow you to build highly scalable VXLAN fabrics out of our technology and manage them via third-party controllers um, and also via the, the Cisco VTS controller, uh, you know, which, which can actually work directly with the eVPN technology. And the third solution you can do, again, on the same hardware is Cisco ACI. Cisco ACI is our enterprise class SDN solution. It introduces the APIC as a source of policy automation for the entire network fabric. And actually, we have a set of OpenStack plugins that can actually manage APIC directly and give you a merged overlay and underlay that can give you physical and virtual integration across the entire environment. And again, that's a solution we'll be working on as the next generation of the Workbology and Karthik we're talking about in terms of our UCS uh, and Red Hat solutions. You know, we'll actually be next tying them into ACI and being able to offer these unified stacks with ACI as the, the networking foundation. I think on that note, um, I'll probably terminate it to make sure that everyone can have you know, time for lunch, but feel free to come grab me after and we can talk more about the ACI solution as well. Yeah, any questions that you guys have? Uh, yep. Happy okay. to take it. Uh, very just, uh, Obviously, thank you to our presenters. Uh, any questions from the audience for Mike or Karthik or Balaji? We are so very clear that they got You it. guys really, <laughs> you must have nailed it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, whoa, that's the second time I've done that. Thank you to our presenters. Um, we're actually now gonna do our uh, end of session drawing. I'm gonna ask maybe our guest to pick the names, I'm going to come around and collect the little cards that we gave you when you walked in. Can you win if you're Cisco or Red Hat? Sorry? Can you win if you're Cisco or Red Hat? Oh. <laughs> you can't win and you can't win. Yeah, right. I, I, would, I would put that the limitations there. So, so while we're waiting, I think uh, the ACI integration into the UCS uh, solution will be available in Q1 time frame, uh, 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 basically hopefully with the Liberty update. Thank yeah, and again, from having worked on this last few months with the Cisco team, there is a lot of complexity that we're taking out of this, this uh, the building blocks for you. The numbers of uh, issues that we're troubleshooting, sorting out for you, it's not something you want to be encountering in a production deployment. So there's a ton of value that's hidden in, this, in the solution that we didn't get to talk about yet today. Okay. All right. Yes, there we go. Last one. Last one. And yes. you no, no, go ahead. You, you, you. There's not that many in there. Good odds. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nice. And the winner is? And the winner is Patrick from HP. Oh, HP. Wow. That, there you go. Congratulations. You can not only take the information and also take the Apple Watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and can we interest you in some nice hardware? Uh, <laughs> uh, again, thank you to our presenters. A nice round of applause for them. Thank you, Gary. Um, everybody go enjoy your lunch break. We have two more sessions this afternoon. Hope you can come back and see us. Uh, Lou Tucker will be uh, part of both of those. So hope you can make it back here in the afternoon.